Good morning and good afternoon for those who are in the other coast. Uh, my name is Guillermo Diaz Fanas. I am a co-chair for the Younger Members Committee of ERI, and it is my pleasure to welcome all of you today for the inaugural ERI Younger Members Committee webinar. Today, we have the pleasure of having uh, Dr. Cici Nicolau uh, presenting a very interesting topic, not only for younger members and the students, but for the general audience of ERI. The topic of today is the big picture and the missing link of earthquake resilience. And before starting, I would like to give some instructions. Um, everyone will be in mute mode. The only uh, person who would be able to speak during the presentation is the presenter. However, if you have any question at any point, please feel free to press the, uh, to type your question and it's gonna be sent to the staff um, that will be able to either address your concern at the moment or bring the question at the end of the presentation. Some little introduction about ERI for those who do know, know the organization. Uh, the Earthquake Engineering Research Institute is the global leader in earthquake engineering. It's a nonprofit uh, with a technical membership society with more than 3,000 members, 14 regional chapters, 65 student chapters and six staff. It is not only present in the US, but it's present in the whole world. And we are dedicated to reducing earthquake risk. Inside of ERI, we have this committee um, called the Younger Members Committee. Uh, the Younger Members Committee uh, provides opportunity to early career professionals within the ERI organization to advance their careers as earthquake professionals and become more active in the Institute. My co-chairs are uh, Professor Ana Hiberdusi uh, from Cal Poly San Luis Obispo and Professor Maria Colliu from Texas A&M University. Um, in our committee, what we try to do is to explore different methods to increase active membership among graduate students and young professionals and, and faculty in the Institute. We try to find uh, technical and social activities to engage these members, not only in the annual meeting, but throughout the year, uh, to allow them to have exposure to the great work of the ERI. One of our subcommittees is uh, the Virtual Earthquake Reconnaissance Team, VIRT, in which younger members um, have the ability to support the learning from earthquakes programs. Um, we also explore ways for the younger members to become advocate of earthquake safety. Um, and through these programs, we try to coordinate and promote opportunities for younger members to serve as liaisons of other committees. We partner with ERI board to implement a strategy to engage, increase the engagement of younger members so that the Institute remains as a vital and effective organization. If you're interested in joining, you could email us at ymc at eri.org or visit us to our website, ymc.eri.org. As I mentioned, this is our subcommittee, BERT, for which uh, uh, we have uh, Professor Rick Fisher and Dr. Mani uh, Shameshi, uh, who are the co-chairs. So if you're interested in this subcommittee as well, please contact us. We want to take this opportunity to um, let everyone know that the SHA Innovation Prize is uh, still open for application. The deadline is January 31st. If you want more information, you can contact us or ERI directly. Similarly, the 11 National Earthquake Engineering Conference uh, is uh, open, and we would like you to keep in mind that it's an opportunity for not only graduate students, but also early career academics and early career professionals to uh, get engaged in the community. Um, so let's now present the speaker of today. Dr. Sisi Nicolau is an assistant vice president and principal in the Technical Excellence Center of WSP Geotechnical and Tunneling uh, Division with more than 20 years of experience and capabilities in structural and geotechnical engineering with emphasis on performance-based design, soil structure interaction, seismic hazard analysis, liquefaction evaluation and mitigation, and risk resiliency assessment of critical facilities. She oversees WSP geotechnical earthquake engineering practice and leads multi-hazard resilience initiatives 
in the WSP Geotech and Tunneling Technical Excellence Center. Dr. Nicolau received a civil engineering diploma from the National Technical University of Athens and a master's and PhD from the University of Buffalo. She holds board positions in ERI and ATC and serves as an advisory member for GEAR. She has co-led reconnaissance missions after many disasters, including Hurricane Sandy in New York City, the Mineral Virginia earthquake, Kefalonia in Greece, the Buisne Ecuador earthquake, and Puebla Morelos, Mexico earthquakes. Um, she's active in seismic code development and has been a chair for the seismic committee of the New York City Building Code since 2014. Dr. Nicolau is recognized as a fellow of ASCE, as the WSP Fellow of Earthquake Engineering, as the New York City ACEC Principal of the Year, the Prakash Prize for Excellence in Geotechnical Practice, and with an innovation by being invited uh, by President Obama in 2016 to the White House Summit on Earthquake Resilience. It is my pleasure to introduce uh, to everyone Dr. Cici Nicolau. Thank you. And thank you, um, young members uh, committee of ERI for giving me the honor of being the first presenter in a topic that I hope um, is of interest to um, especially our young members of ERI, but I think um, all of us in the, in the earthquake engineering community are struggling with um, resiliency. Um, what I would like to say is that the intent of um, my talk is to bring up a lot of unknowns to you, especially the young members, and um, let you know that there are a lot of things that um, we need to look with a fresh uh, set of eyes, and um, you don't need to follow the paths of others, you need to understand that we have many challenges and your minds are uh, something we can benefit from. And I hope that um, there will be some seeds that will be planted in your mind today that we can continue this conversation. And even after this um, webinar, I will be available. And also hopefully, um, and during the uh, maybe the um, national conference that is coming up in uh, LA, we can have um, uh, meetings and talk more about it. But um, going into um, first of all, the uh, one of the big problems is the definition of this word that seems to be overused um, in engineering in the recent years. Uh, but there was a consensus from um, the National Academy of Engineering on what resiliency means for engineers, and that is the ability to anticipate, prepare for, adapt to changing conditions, withstand, and rapidly recover from disastrous events. Now, um, our EERI uh, team, um, uh, with the executive director as the first author in the 16th World Co Conference of Earthquake Engineering, uh, published um, what resiliency, um, a resiliency framework for reconnaissance applications, and, and they define there that um, uh, resilience in earthquake engineering, um, learning from reconnaissance, um, is the ability of a community to maintain uh, functionality and vital services in the face of stressors and uh, shocks. And they recognize, as we all do, that it's a complex, uh, multifaceted concept. How complex it is, you can see it here from the new re released, it's available online, um, resiliency of transit systems threatened by natural disasters um, document. It's available online for free from the National Academy uh, publications. And uh, it shows on the right a graph of the um, interconnection of different functions in a system um, that is very much an interdependent system when you look at the community. So you can see that obviously you can have a, the main shock that could be an earthquake and that could have a lot of 
cascading effects uh, that could be interruption of services, it could be fires, it could be interruptions in electric power, gas, port facilities, and this is just the start of it because this is what could happen right after. And of course, there are, there are a lot of um, effects that have to do with uh, what happens long term after an earthquake and how do we um, recover from it and what does this mean? And um, within that framework is the bigger picture of, of resilience. So um, why do we need it? I would like to have a few takeaways that are what we are dealing with as the new frontier and the big challenge uh, that you will have in your careers, staying in hopefully in the field of earthquake engineering. Um, there has been a very large increase on the frequency and the destructiveness of extreme events. Uh, this is a picture from um, the GEAR mission uh, with ATC on the Ecuador earthquake, the Muisni magnitude 7.8 in 2016, um, where you see um, a catastrophe of, of um, a roadway, which was uh, evident all across the affected area, which was practically a very large part of the western shoreline of the country. Uh, so 2006 until 2017 came was the worst um, um, the worst year in global economic losses from disasters, uh, causing um, uh, earthquake insurances more than uh, about 160 billion dollars, and that was a 68 percent increase um, from the previous year. These are from data from the Swiss reinsurance. Um, later, I will show you what's happening in 2017, but you can only imagine with all these catastrophic hurricanes, wildfires, and earthquakes, uh, how bad um, these numbers um, increase. So uh, this is one of the major needs to uh, invest and try to develop earthquake resilience. The second um, uh, pressing need is because of the condition of our infrastructure. Uh, this is um, the infrastructure report car card from the American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, the report is also available online and I would encourage you to take a look at it. It gives a grade to each one of the infrastructure components um, and the overall grade that we have received um, is a D plus, uh, which is not really good. So um, not only the infrastructure is aging, but the population is increasing. The rate are, that globally our population is increasing is on more than 50% rate. And we expect that this rate is going to reach 65% by year 2050. That comes with a demand from this population to increase the capacity of the infrastructure systems, create new ones, and somehow maintain and uh, make those aged infrastructure components um, uh, sustainable. Um, this cost, just to give you an idea, uh, for the United States alone, uh, just for maintenance, it's about 100 billion a year. Um, in India, it can reach up to $8 billion a year for bad roads. And that has only to do with transportation and without any earthquakes imposed on this infrastructure. So um, this, this um, maintenance issue, because of the tremendous demand that we have, cre is creating what we call the global um, gap in the economy. So right now, uh, worldwide, uh, we spend three, $3 trillion a year just to maintain the aged infrastructure. and we need six so we are only putting in half of them and um, again this is without uh, imposing extreme shocks in these systems so there is a need to do something differently from what we do because we cannot catch up we are already tremendously behind and uh, one of the most if not the most important parameters when we talk about dollars after uh, extreme events 
has to do with um, the downtime, uh, which is interruption of services, uh, which can create worse loss with local and global effects. Uh, we saw that uh, in the United States with a hurricane, with Hurricane Sandy, that uh, had no major um, structural damage, uh, but um, a lot of the facilities, buildings, and uh, infrastructure could not work because of the water. And um, uh, also the Wall Street had to shut down for a couple of days, which has a tremendous impact not only in the, in the New York and United States, but in the world um, uh, altogether. Uh, this picture is an, a picture from the recent uh, last year Kaikoura earthquake in New Zealand. Uh, where um, the, um, it cost the government uh, on the order of $3 billion, and it had a direct GDP, which is the gross domestic product, impact on um, uh, about half a billion in the country, and a downtime because of the massive landslides to repair the transportation networks. So you can imagine that in the aftermath of an earthquake, if you do not have potable water, if you cannot use the bathroom, if you don't have elevators, then it doesn't matter if you are structurally safe. And that is a concept I would like to focus on a lot about what safety means in the modern time of earthquake engineering and how there is a need to think about it a little bit differently. So the, in the big picture and the big challenges that we have of resiliency is that we need to go beyond the numbers. We need to understand the uh, expect what, what could be a black swan or the unexpected and think the unthinkable and not necessarily make everything perfect, but be able to sustain functionality and um, retain um, the life um, uh, safety. So um, there are two parts to achieving national and uh, natural disaster resiliency, and it happens uh, both for an individual structure and in a system or a community where you could have an, an interconnection of systems, as I showed you earlier. So one part has to do with understanding our hazard exposure, which is a different concept than the associated risk. So um, high hazard exposure area, like Chile, for example, could be on a lower risk than a lower hazard exposure area like Haiti um, because of the preparedness and the uh, type of construction and earthquake codes that are in effect. And we will talk about that. Now, if we understand the exposure to hazards, which would be the demand in our system or individual structure, we can use technologies, monitoring, uh, protective systems um, to better prepare and or mitigate uh, the threats that we have. I will go back to this plot and have a lot of discussions about that. But, um, the word of resiliency, unfortunately, has become the answer to everything. You can see it on our everyday life. And um, um, these are, um, I, I, for those of you, of you who are of my age and you have um, seen past beauty pageants, there is always the question of, um, the different uh, contestants about what would you wish for the world? And the answer has always been world peace and maybe something else. So these are pictures from different um, um, beauty pageants where the Miss Universe always said world peace, world peace, until Miss Philippines said that she would wish for the world resilience in 2013 and she won. This is an interesting set of slides uh, from the University of Canterbury that I borrowed um, to show how resiliency has been probably overused, but at the same time, it has resonance with people. And the key um, uh, missing link, the way I see it, has to do with people. So when we uh, were on site in Ecuador um, a few days after the earthquake happened, 
uh, with uh, the gear team and ATC, we um, collected immediately that's something that you um, uh, do if you are, especially if you're an old timer uh, like me compared to you, you would go and look at newspapers and magazines from the day of the earthquake and not the internet necessarily. So this is from a very popular magazine in Ecuador where people that had lost their homes, that had no food, no water, um, what the key word that you can see was the demand of the people was resilience. And that really troubled me because I had not seen that before and it really showed me that um, this word is here to stay. We just need to uh, make sure we tailor it and we understand how we can develop better the, the next era of earthquake engineering to address it. So the new frontier that um, you will be faced and we are being faced right now is that really engineering resiliency is not the solution of everything. It is often considered as the tool of bouncing back after an extreme event, a big earthquake. But really what I want to discuss here with you is that it is a part of a puzzle, not the whole picture. The frontier and the challenge that we have as earthquake engineers is to translate this common desire from the people, as you just saw, for resiliency into quantifiable terms and design frameworks while considering where we are in terms of the life cycle of um, the infrastructure. And um, we need to protect against what is possible beyond what is probable. And the way to do that is that by really offering different decision-making uh, tools to clients or stakeholders so that, that they can decide what is acceptable to them and their society. Um, the biggest challenge is that um, we tend to follow the paths of others, especially when there is some, some emerging topic. We want our young members to think out of the box. We, um, all, we all benefit from that. And we want you to use engineering as it was created, as an art that can be carved using innovation and tools that we have currently, but also lessons from the past. And that's the core of our Learning from Earthquakes program in ERI, to create future cities and safely sustain existing communities. And as I mentioned, the human factor is a missing link. And we really need to look at the bigger picture. Uh, there are many disciplines involved, but there is also a human factor that involves education, clear communication of a message from the government, from the stakeholders, from the agencies, from the engineers, that creates trust that has been proven to be very important in rebounding from disasters. And of course, risk prevention and growth of the society itself. So I will go through individual um, these, these uh, points that are the, the seeds that I was talking about um, that I'm trying to plant and, and I start with uh, what um, is easier for us to discuss because it has to do with whenever we have a problem we need to find some quantities to address the problem as engineers and put it in some math and a formula and get some result and then get um, methods that can be translated to design codes and of course, in, consider where we are with each project in order to apply them. So the codes trace back in ancient times. Uh, for those, those of you who are from the younger members, you may not have seen that, but um, I, I got that from Charlie Kircher, and there are many earthquake engineers that show this slide, that show the um, Hammurabi's code from um, Mesopotamia. Uh, that was uh, in um, the code or the, the law of the land that addressed 
what would happen if a builder built a house and uh, they don't construct it safely enough and the house falls from an earthquake or from whatever other reason and kills the owner, then the code would say that the builder would also be put to death. So this must have been very scary. Uh, we have obviously moved as society from that and we have um, um, we have created frameworks and uh, where we are right now on um, on earthquake engineering is that the performance-based design has almost become um, a common uh, reference as an approach uh, to um, uh, especially structural problems where we don't look at just one earthquake but we look at different levels of earthquake where depending on how intense the earthquake is like in the green area you see a small frequent earthquake that you expect to happen during your lifetime in your structure and in that earthquake you would like to have what we call immediate occupancy as your performance in a rare earthquake we would like to have life safety and in a very rare earthquake we would like to have collapse prevention and of course if you go beyond that um, you may not uh, survive so this life safety is something that i want you to have in mind and concentrate a lot on because life safety in general in codes in the past uh, um, quite few years means that uh, you may have under the extreme event you may have significant damage you may need to even replace your structure or parts of your structure but your building is going to give you the opportunity to get out of it alive and that is the concept of life safety so it's it's what happens immediately after an earthquake and i want you to keep that in mind um, right now in terms of um, prescriptive models of codes uh, we have moved into a risk-based framework where we are targeting instead of these different hazards of earthquakes, different return periods, we are targeting some um, risk objective, which in the case of the most recently released AESC 716, um, that is um, um, a 1% chance in 50 years. Uh, given that we uh, satisfy life safety objectives, that means um, that has an underlying understanding that comes from economy and comes from um, a lot of investment that has to be made. So if you had a brand new city that was built with this new code and you had a category one or two uh, building that um, is a regular building, then the probability of total or partial collapse if the big event happens would be a 10% and 25% endangerment of lives. And, you know, all codes, including static codes, they include assumptions like that because there are economic factors associated to this. The question is how much of the people know about that and how much do they understand when they get angry and they react after an earthquake because their building was not perfect although it was built to code so frameworks that we have right now the most um, the latest in um, in earthquake engineering assessment is uh, the um, risk-based frameworks that uh, associate the natural hazard that we cannot control but we can predict it with probabilistic methods and other methods with the vulnerability which, which is a, how an existing structure has been made and how um, uh, what is its condition or how the new structure is made to quantify the losses in the three d's as we call them which is the downtime the damage and the death or injuries and once we know all that our risk is not just damage anymore but it's downtime and death and um, uh, hopefully that's not the case but it could be uh, severe injuries we need to enforce and for solutions of mitigation uh, long-term monitoring action plans and training in order to um, uh, to uh, uh, to take action for that risk so there is available to us um, a next generation of tools in ATC 58, 
about um, um, uh, how we could um, uh, assess um, uh, seismically a structural response and calculate the, the 3Ds, which is what you see on the um, bottom right-hand side. You can use different levels of um, intensity-based uh, earthquakes or scenario earthquakes and uh, come up with structural uh, response based on models that are usually nonlinear uh, models and combine them with actual experimental data that can give you, at the end of the day, connect some ground motion or structural uh, response parameters to a performance of one of these 3Ds. And I would, um, uh, and these are called fragility curves. I would encourage you to take a look at ATC 58. They have more than 700 building components and different damage states connecting them to different parameters like drift, ground acceleration, spectral acceleration, et cetera. That's a graph of um, PATC 58. Now doing a performance-based design in geotechnical engineering, uh, which is my field of, of, of concentration, is much, much more difficult because of the uh, many unknowns, especially in the material that we're dealing with and the extent of the, the, the projects and the uniqueness of them. So in, a, in an analogy to performance-based design, if you were to have, let's say, a dam or um, a slope, you can look into a frequent earthquake and talk about safety factors. But when you move into a rare earthquake, safety factor does not maybe mean a lot, and you need to go into the actual performance of the geostructure. And when you look at large deformation, you may want to even accept partial or total failure, but look at what are the effects of this into the overall um, system that you are serving. So in the next uh, frontier of the, the human factor, and uh, how is this a missing link? Uh, I think what is very, very important is our uh, communicating risk as engineers to the public. And this is a very interesting application of an artist um, uh, named Herdrich, she's in uh, Japan, that she uh, takes uh, um, data from uh, actual studies and presents them in the form of this, uh, what I, I consider beautiful. So, what, so everybody thinks they're going to die from a terrorist attack or from a plane crash, from what it looks like. And what you see in the same color below the line is what is the, the reality. So the reality is that maybe most of us are going to be exposed to cancer or a car accident or a heat wave versus this. So there is something to be said about the perception of risk of people. And um, uh, often um, people uh, believe that, that they are or they are not exposed to risk based on what we offer to them. So sometimes uh, people that do not know that they are exposed in a certain risk, like the Eastern United States, uh, that um, rarely have earthquakes, they think they're immune to that hazard because they never have seen it. And that is not true. It's, it's maybe may even worse because they are not prepared for it. Or others may feel very comfortable with a certain hazard because they have felt it over and over and over again. And because they have survived, they think they're okay for the next one. So their response as humans in the next one is very biased to their understanding and perception of risk. Um, we have, I think we are, okay, we are moving. I'm sorry about that. that there was something in the transmission. Okay, so conveying risk to the public has to do, as I said, the ASC 716 has this 1% in 50 years chances of collapse, but that is only for the extreme event, the maximum considered earthquake, uh, which is um, about um, the 2500 year earthquake. It has some adjustments, but I'm not going to go in all of this. So look how you could communicate what is the MCE. Uh, to, let's say, to parents that I talk to in schools. So MCE is a 1 to 2,500 year earthquake. And that is compared to the 1 in 100 year flood. You know, people are like, oh, that's very rare. That's, you know, that's great that you're designing for this. 
then when you tell them that this same number means that a, you are 98% certain that this earthquake is not going to happen in 50 years, but 2% chances it's going to happen, then they don't like that number. They would like this number to be much, much lower than that. And then when you tell them the, um, the fact that the one in 2,500 years means that it can happen right now or it can happen in 2,500 years, then that's something they do not like at all. So we have a responsibility to explain risk and not underestimate the understanding of our audience or clients when we convey that. Because coupling risk and what risk means in terms of probabilities and consequences is a key to decisions for, for them. So in this picture, you know, you can go for the chocolate cake or you can go for the salad, but you will have um, an immediate reward and uh, for the one case and a long-term reward of health in the other case. So decisions are very important. Um, there have been some efforts to associate societal risk with geotechnical engineering, and that traces back to um, um, 1994 is the graph that I'm showing you, um, but Professor Seed had also made similar graphs about risk and uh, Professor Finn talking about uh, large dams where you, had, you still have some criteria on to what is an acceptable probability of loss of life per year and uh, as um, a function of um, the, the, the risks. So um, the ground motion probabilities were combined with the probability of failure and how much this failure means in terms of how much I have invested, where I am with maintenance, and where will I be with decommission of life. Now, um, going into the life safety concept, and that's something we, we should communicate to the public, uh, life safety is something that, uh, as I said, is a structural concept that allows you to get out of your house alive. So Professor Bray from UC Berkeley followed this um, residential house that sustained multiple liquefaction events in the Christchurch um, uh, series of earthquakes. Uh, as you know, it was a case of um, many, many um, uh, liquefaction um, uh, uh, instances in uh, a period of more than a year where this house satisfied life safety but the yard was full of uh, liquefied ground in the first earthquake of 2010 and it became even worse in the 2011 where you can actually see the sun boils so the owner still he had satisfied life safety uh, but in the april 2011 earthquake uh, he had already put pavers, which he thought that are going to hold the pavement down, but they didn't. Um, and uh, he had the same problem again. And in part one of 2011, where he had done more innovation, he had the same problem and then even worse in part two. And, and the worst thing than that is that um, the insurances now have this house in a flood zone that it was not in a flood zone before. So getting your insurance money became a very big issue, a fight between flood and earthquake insurance. Still life safety in what we call is satisfied. So life safety to me is not enough anymore. And it's not enough because it, it, it deals with what happens right after an earthquake and only about the structural effects essentially. So when you look at studies after uh, big earthquakes, you can see that long term, and these are studies from Japan that I show here from Fukushima and from Kobe, Kobe uh, where they studied employment status, habit of people long term. They saw that more than half of um, the evacuees of Fukushima have PTSD. Many, many people after extreme events experience depression that is long term and could be severe. So how do you uh, achieve human resiliency? It's a very difficult thing to predict um, response of populations. It's very uncertain. And what studies have shown is that education and preparedness can um, reduce the uncertainty in predicting that. So there is um, a school of thought that is very parallel to, um, uh, to um, including 
uh, the, uh, the experience of a big earthquake uh, in making you stronger. And that goes both for people and for buildings or our structures. And um, uh, what um, I want to emphasize here is that one of the ways that people can go through uh, trauma is if they feel that they are part of the reconstruction process. And this, what you see here on the left is um, a photograph from the military helicopter that we use in Ecuador that shows the large Camarones farms, which is one of the biggest resources of the economy there. Um, it's fishing and tourism. These are the two main um, economic uh, um, factors and they were both affected severely. So what we uh, advised the um, local government there was to get the fishermen that have been doing that all their lives in generations and they couldn't do anything else and teach them how they could um, rebuild instead of having them relocate, which is something that you, can, um, uh, you cannot uh, rebound from. So um, really we don't need to have um, the worst, um, the, the, a big one to change things. Uh, the society itself uh, tells us that we cannot not plan for the worst case scenario because it's fearfully or that we cannot predict it. What the society wants is that we, can, we should prevent earthquakes from becoming national disasters. So we need to find ways to incorporate resiliency. So what we want is not to bounce back to what you saw in the previous pictures, but rather what we call bounce forward to something better. So we want to protect and create decision-making tools uh, that are based on many, many different factors of the uh, resilience um, lenses. So in the World Economic Forum of um, 2012, and then there's another one going on right now, many prominent company, companies become to take note of the actual issue of resilience and they created an initiative to define the capacity of an organization to adapt and prosper in high impact, uh, low probability risks. Um, this analysis is applicable to any system like a business organization or communities. And the work led to nine resiliency lenses that are grouped into three categories that you see here. And each one has three lenses and um, uh, going into um, uh, the, the first one is the structural resilience that considers the systematic dynamics within the system, the integrative resilience that which underlines complex interconnections with the external context, and the transformative resilience that responds to the fact that mitigating some risks requires transformation. So going into the structural resiliency, um, this category requires redundancy, um, system modularity, and um, uh, diversity, which is a key re resiliency strategy. And that is something that cannot be um, left out in both disciplines and the types of people that are involved and communities. The integrative resilience uh, lens mainly focuses on the contents of the system and its interconnection. And I'm not going to go through um, this in great detail because we are running uh, behind. And um, the last category of transformative emphasizes that resilience is not simply about being able to return to the starting point, not being able to rebound after a shock but uh, moving forward and that has to do with a lot of factors including what i think is very relevant to us which is experiments and innovation and um, this is something a, a takeaway and all of these um, have to move together and, and and compose the big picture of how we quantify um, resiliency so a resilient system uh, going beyond just the resilience um, uh, is um, uh, uh, what, what we often talk about when we talk resilience is also a robustness. 
as part of the concept of a framework to enhance seismic resilience of communities, like uh, professors Bruno and uh, Reinhorn have said back more than 10 years ago, seismic resilience has been defined as the ability of the system to reduce the chances of a shock, to absorb such a shock if it occurs. Um, more specifically, a resilient system is the one that shows reduced failure probabilities, reduced consequences from failures, reduced time to recovery. But there is also the anti-fragile system where anti-fragility is a property of systems that increase in capacity, increase in resiliency or robustness as a result of stress or shocks and what could happen to it like an earthquake. So anti-fragility is beyond resiliency or robustness, and the resilient uh, resists shocks and stays the same, but the anti-fragile gets better. So I don't know if that means that we want to have many, many earthquakes happening all the time, uh, but one um, example of going uh, beyond resiliency has to do with um, evolution itself, and you can see that um, you know, the dinosaurs are, are fragile because they are subjected to large lethal shocks. Um, the rhino is robust because it can handle adversity but stay the same. And the agile uh, can move and adapt rapidly, uh, but the anti-fragile would grow and improve from external uh, shocks. And that's what we want to achieve. And sometimes this happens just by the selection of the nature. And for you, those of you who know who Carl Sagan is and Cosmos, his um, series about um, uh, talking about the universe, he talked about the natural selection of the uh, samurai crabs, where it's a, um, a phenomenon in Japan where suddenly the sea, um, a particular sea of, of Japan, was full of crabs that really looked like warriors. And nobody could understand that. They thought it's um, an anathema or a result of the gods. And um, uh, what uh, in reality was happening is that the fishermen, uh, many, many hundreds of years ago, when they started fishing these, these crabs, whenever they saw um, uh, any of them, that looked like that, they threw them back in the sea because nobody would eat them because they looked scary. So eventually what happened with a period of time is that um, more and more they, these uh, evolved and they, they reproduced and they were not wanted for consumption. So they became themselves anti-fragile just because of the way they looked. So we need to understand all of these things and make uh, some decision tools instead of just frameworks and codes. And what we have been enforcing is a, a support platform for decisions, for um, stakeholders, for cities, for populations, but also individual important facilities that have interconnected systems um, in transportation and in buildings to minimize maintenance costs and um, as and, and optimize the downtime of assets. So of course you need to um, include the multi-hazard design, you need to have hazard experts and risk experts, but you need to have all these different disciplines in order just to assess the risk with the 3Ds that we talked about, but then you need to go beyond that and have real-time information that can give you a system that is truly resilient. And this can be done with visual means, with technology, uh, with planners, uh, with even uh, sociologists and other um, disciplines. And what you want to do is to understand the structural health, uh, use monitoring, and have not only an immediate risk assessment of where you are now, but include instrumentation that can show you in real time where you are with the functions, but where you are if an event happens. And as we talked about in bouncing back, if you have many small shocks in the system, you can learn and reassess um, what you need to do, create improvements and create action plans and use technology like UAVs, drones, trained personnel, to, um, to immediately react to an event. 
So in this upper chart, you see essentially what I showed you on about ADC, where you evaluate the hazard, you assess vulnerabilities, you propose retrofit. But what we want to do is go beyond that and talk about resiliency and do testing for other hazards. And often you would be surprised how bad you can do on one hazard when you're trying to fix another. And I'll show you an example about that. Um, you also need to look at non-structural that could be the main cause of the downtime that, as we said, can be detrimental, but very importantly, look at cascading hazards like fire, floods um, after earthquakes, and propose monitoring and technologies in order to have redundancies in the next event and have an improved asset while you're maintaining it at the same time. So it's quite complex, right? And usually when we do that, we use a lot of visual tools and a lot of instrumentation, real-time instrumentation. And it's very complex. Usually it's done on, on a client-specific um, basis. So um, where I want to, um, to close with that is that we really need to start thinking of things that worked well and why they worked well, instead of keep analyzing why things fail after earthquakes. And this is the new um, uh, generation of our LFE program that we are all very proud of, which is the Learning on Sites program. We had a pilot that uh, happened in the World Conference in Chile with great success. And it's based on um, a program that has been going on for many years uh, between Japan and Greece, where um, experts take uh, young members that could be graduate students or young professionals to a site long term after an earthquake has happened to really look at resiliency and look at populations and look at what worked and did not work. And um, also when we do reconnaissance, we have tried to focus in past years having so um, much better technology that allows us to collect data very rapidly as compared to the past to see why things worked well instead of why things failed. So I would encourage you to take a look at this LFE. It's extremely exciting um, to go to sites and, and look at um, what happened. And um, we are talking right now about the next location of where that will happen. So what you see here is our reconnaissance that was a joint mission between year ERI and ATC in 2014 in Cephalonia, Greece. Uh, when we looked at um, what you see as a three-story three, um, reinforced concrete building frame, um, which um, we had a record very close to it, and I will show you that record. And based on the rule of thumb, like 0.1 seconds per floor, uh, this house should have collapsed. And um, uh, everything else around it collapsed. Of, of course, it wasn't, some of them were masonry and all that. But this house not only did not collapse, but you cannot see really any damage. There is some bricks that fell off, some non structural stuff. And it had a soft story. It was a cafe at the, at the bottom of it. And we could not understand why. It was just two kilometers north of the CVH record, uh, which is the orange record that you see here. Uh, where you can see impressive uh, spectral acceleration that reached 3G uh, on this record. And um, if you take the rule of thumb for a three-story building, it would be right there. It would be between 0.2 and 0.3 seconds. And of course, it was not designed for that. It was designed per code that you can see with a black line. So even if it was in the soft soil category, it, it was hit by two, three times its design load, so we could not understand why this happened. Uh, but we did have a structural uh, group with us, led by Ramon Gilsons of GMS, um, and we were able to take a lot of data from the owners that usually keep drawings in their houses. This is um, the standard in Greece. Uh, we took the records from the seismological institutes there, and we um, took the ground motion that was recorded in soils and deconvoluted it uh, to the rock to simulate the conditions of that building because we thought, oh, maybe the ground motion, it, it was the soil effects in the ground motion and this building did not uh, feel anything. But when uh, Ramon's team analyzed it, um, they would fail the building with these ground motions. 
And um, we could not understand why until we put uh, what is called the SANAS, which is uh, stiffening elements that happen between the infills. And once we did that, the structural period of the building that was calculated in the model to be without the infill at around 0.3 to 0.26 seconds, which made sense, now with the infill practically became a rigid body. And uh, we did a lot of different parametrics to understanding, and we realized that this building moved with a PGA, which it could sustain. So we, uh, this is a very big lesson that we learned, and also the methodology, this Greek methodology, which is also applicable in, uh, in generally in uh, the Balkans, uh, is something that people do empirically. And uh, me being from there, you know, I have seen that that's how they built the infill masonry and it seems to be working and it's a very lightweight infill that could benefit um, a lot um, you know poor uh, areas that cannot invest a lot um, so this was one lesson to be learned there is an article if you would like to see in the structure magazine about it and a big year eri 83 report on their reconnaissance um, the other thing is to think differently and sometimes, and this is a very controversial issue, um, and have heuristic approaches, which is kind of, of educated shortcuts and um, looking at things differently. So this is a conventional way of how we must design, let's say, bridge piers. So we always want the damage to happen in the superstructure. Um, if you have applied any codes, you will see that the R factors for foundations is always one. You want to have the foundation remain elastic because it's hard to fix it after an earthquake. And what this, and this is a conventional way. So what happens is you end up with very large foundations and you force um, a fixity which um, attacks very large moments at the base of a pier. Now, if you were able to have some control hinging at the foundation, some controlled small rotation due to failure of the soil, then you would release this moment, you would become, you would not have fixity anymore. It's a totally different philosophy and quite, as I said, controversial because it's something you have to do with a lot of caution and knowing what you're doing. And But you can, you can um, have tremendous savings in, in the foundation cost and better performance that could avoid structural uh, failure. Of course, there is a price to pay, like in every decision, there is a risk and a price and a reward. So the potential price here is that there could be residual settlements that you have to fix and rotations, which you should mitigate. And that is um, a concept that has been developed by Professor Gazeras in the National Technical University of Athens. And I can provide you with a lot of um, references for that. So going back to where we started, this is your big challenge. We want you to think of how you can achieve natural disaster and resiliency, whatever that means. And it means different things even for earthquakes, depending on your community and what you're looking at. So I think some key components of achieving um, what natural disaster resilience is to collaborate, educate, but also to go back to the roots, think simple and look at the big picture, both for a structure and a community. Um, so this is um, obviously a need. This is what I promised in the beginning. There has been more than $300 billion in losses in 2007 from the, in the United States, um, alone from different natural disasters, not just earthquakes. Uh, so uh, FEMA has realized that prevention works. Uh, for earthquakes, there has been a ratio of for every dollar you put, there is a 1.4 return. For wind and flood is bigger. And um, when I was visiting uh, Vancouver in Canada, where they have a big program for improving schools for earthquake resiliency, they told me, no, the return that we have is one on 10. And I could not understand why, if the data were skewed or what was happening, but what they do there is they account for these frequent events and how much this return is important to them for the continuation of functions and how they learn how their buildings behave. And actually the ICC just recently, I think this week, released a report 
that talks about a general one dollar to six return for investing in resiliency and the proof is on the case studies so what you see here is a chart from the geohazard international that shows that in the mega earthquake of Chile to the right only one person out of um, the more than 100 in Haiti died in the mega earthquake of Chile versus the much much smaller earthquake in Haiti and that is a direct um, relation of the hazard versus risk that we discussed and how much better the design is there we need to understand why some old structures are more resilient and this is a picture from Turkey where you see the eminent being intact um, I'm not sure why is that uh, but talking with Professor Constantino of the University at Buffalo, um, you can see that there are systems of base isolation tra tra tracing back in ancient times. So closing, um, we need to think, and that is uh, no matter how well we design, if we don't respect nature, we are inevitably going to make bad decisions. And uh, talking about multi-hazards, uh, we can be very good about floods in this um, uh, particular example of raising buildings above the flood level. But as you know, this is a very bad case of soft stories that you want to avoid. And of course, in earthquakes, stronger is not always better. And, and this is a, an example from the Fukiai section in Japan. Uh, so at the end of the day, it's all about people, and uh, that is, I think, the missing uh, link that I want to, uh, to um, point out. Uh, I know we have exceeded the time, but it's important for me to mention my colleagues, uh, both from WSP, NTUA, and from um, uh, the Dominican Republic, and the University at Buffalo and Ecuador, um, that have contributed to these ideas. And I'm looking forward to your questions and continuing our discussion. Um, thank you very much, and uh, please remember the uh, concept of anti-fragility that we discussed. Thank you so much, Christy. Uh, so, I just wanted to uh, close this uh, webinar today. I want to make a couple announcements. Um, first one is, um, I have been asked a couple times already by many of you if we will have access to this uh, recording. And we will have access uh, sometime uh, within the next two weeks. You should receive an email um, with a link to the recording. Similarly, uh, for those interested in professional development hours, um, they will be available and more, more information will be provided in the follow-up email. We will also have a post-webinar survey that is very important, uh, very important for us, the Younger Members Committee. We want to try to understand our audience so that we can always uh, plan ahead and tailor the presenters for future webinars uh, based on the audience that we are uh, getting. This is the first one of many. We hope that uh, we have uh, many more that are successful like this one. We're very, very grateful to every one of you. Um, I want to remind you as well to uh, renew your membership for ERI in case that you're a member already. And if you're not and it's the first time you're learning about ERI, uh, please uh, contact us and, and, and try to register. There are many opportunities, uh, not only for students, but also for younger professionals, younger faculty, and uh, in, in following your career. So with that, um, I have time to take uh, one or two questions. Um, the first question uh, is it's more of a thought. Uh, I'm going to read it. It says, for Resilience and its structural response concept of failing safely applied. This is yeah. Yeah, well, sorry, it's just a little hard to hear you. Maybe you're a little too far from the microphone. Sorry, I was. I wanted to uh, read the questions. Uh, the first one, it's more of a thought. It says, for resilience, is the structural response concept of failing safely applied? This is so very effective in an automobile safety issues like collapsing elements, engine going under the cases in a crash rather than into the cabin. Thank you. Yeah, I think I think that's um, you know one of the things um, that we want to 
to do when we talk about thinking out of the box is to look at different uh, industries, look at different studies that are so relevant to us sometimes. So this, this concept of failing safely could be similar to what I showed for the rotation of the footing, because essentially you are, you are saving the whole bridge if that concept works. And also what um, I have seen in high-rise uh, performance-based design is to have some intentional places of, um, of failure concentration in the design so that you can um, achieve um, resiliency for the whole building by having sacrificial elements. So that's, uh, that is a great uh, food for thought, and I think that's the way that we should go thinking about it. Okay, thank you, Sissy. I'm going to go ahead for the second and final question. If you submitted another question, we will try to respond them after this webinar, just in the interest of time. Um, so the question is, as speaking about technological advances, how do you consider the artificial intelligence as a contributor in a structural resilience versus the regular engineering methods based on calibrated models? Yeah, I think that is uh, very, very important. And um, the the availability of technology is uh, fantastic. And it's something that we should use. And when we use it properly, it is shown to be working. But at the same time, what I try to emphasize is that you cannot lose your common sense. You cannot uh, rely completely on the artificial intelligence or technology. There has to be a combination of the two. And at the end of the day, we are all, um, you know, under Newton's law, right? Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the force that we're going to feel from the earthquake is mass times the acceleration. If this doesn't work, then there is something wrong in, you know, the, the calculations. So a combination of the two uh, is something that we want to do. We don't want to blindly um, depend. So in the system that I showed where we can use monitoring, and learn, and the monitoring can be on real time. It can give you immediately um, uh, uh, tools to decide to stop some operations, to shut down gas supply, to do a lot of things that immediately can save lives. And you rely completely on the technology, but you really have to have inspectors go and see if your predictions were correct. Because at the end of the day, you know, even artificial intelligence learns from um, the input that we provide and learns from itself. So I think a combination of the two is the most important um, way to go. I'm going to take, uh, I, I see that there are more questions. Uh, given that these are short questions, I'm going to take this other one. Um, someone is asking about where they can find the report about the three-story building that sustained a very big ground motion. Um, the in the Greek one, uh, the um, the one that um, uh, you have seen has a very comprehensive uh, gear report. Um, it is also on the our clearinghouse ERI website. And um, if you go either to the ERI website or in the gearorganization.org website, I believe that it's report number thirty four. But there is a map there, and you can go uh, find Greece on the map. And uh, this report is there. is a is a very big report. Um, but there is also the studies that we showed are published, and I'll make them available to ERI, and they can distribute them to uh, anybody who is interested or or post them in our clearinghouse. Okay, and I'll take a, this final question is very long, so I'm just going to take a part of it. Um, the question is. Um, it's more of a comment. It says, uh, I believe that what is missing is not the link, but the commitment to resilience. Would you agree? No, absolutely. I mean, it's the, the problem is so multifaceted and it's so multidisciplinary. And it so depends in non-engineering decisions, right? That um, there has to be a commitment. So. Um, as you all know, we are in expectation of a big earthquake, a big subduction earthquake that could happen in the Western United States. And um, 
uh, I, I believe that the, the US has been rather delayed in having an early warning system, uh, which is uh, you know, part of technology you can use for resiliency and, and responding to earthquakes. And that's something that we have to insist that it's going to be applicable as it is in other places uh, that may not be as wealthy as us, like uh, Chile or Mexico. And um, um, I think that the commitment has uh, also comes with a cost and uh, it has to be combined with other things that we have to be committed to, like sustainability, uh, the effects of climate change and the other hazards that we are exposed to. And I do agree. I, I, I love all these questions and I would love to have a discussion because it's not a dialogue, but uh, I can offer my opinion. Thank you so much uh, for everyone, uh, to everyone for attending to uh, CC for presenting. And I want to also thank, and especially to the ERI staff who worked very hard with us, uh, or volunteer uh, webinar coordinator, Ji Su Lee from Arab. And my co-chairs, Anahid and Maria, thank you everyone for attending. Uh, if you have any other question, please uh, go to our website, ymc.eri.org, or email us at ymc.eri.org. Thank you. <laughs>